Welcome to the Lightkeepers podcast. I'm Clayton Vandiver, your Lightkeeper, with the show dedicated to everyone who wants to get the very most quality out of life that they can. My co-host, as always, Charlene, our very own licensed clinical social worker in the state of Florida, who is joining the conversation this week about what happens when you get discharged from the hospital. We talked last week about what happens in the hospital, Mm -hmm. And now we're going to talk about what happens next, right here on this episode of the Lightkeepers Podcast. Before we start, please leave your questions or comments below. We love to hear from you. Questions this week will be answered on the show next week uh, on the next episode of the Lightkeepers podcast. Every Wednesday evening, 7 p.m. Eastern. Charlene, good to have you again with us here. What happens when you get discharged from a hospital? Well, and a lot of people don't know what to expect with that because it can vary depending on why you were in the hospital. Absolutely. Most of the time when someone is discharged from the hospital, um, one of two things is going to happen. They're either going to go home uh, with instructions to follow up with their primary care physician or their specialist, mm-hmm. whatever is required. Um, on the other hand, sometimes when someone is discharged from the hospital, they may not be ready to go home yet and they may need a little more help to get themselves ready to go home, at which point they would be discharged to a rehab facility, which is pretty much kind of like a nursing home, except they do physical therapy there and you're not there permanently. Okay. Well, when you are in these sorts of facilities, is your family a part of that visit? Are they able to be with you and as they would be in a hospital? So every facility has its own visiting hours. So I would encourage everyone to check in with that facility and find out what the visiting hours are. Um, before setting up any, you know, preconceived ideas about when they can visit and how much time they can spend with their loved one. Now, something that a lot of people don't realize, uh, and this is very important to know, especially during the COVID pandemic, when people were being discharged to facilities, sometimes the facilities were not nearby. And that's something that the patient and the family has no control over. Um, the hospital will try to work with the family to discharge their loved one to a facility that's of their choosing or is nearby. Mm -hmm. But if there is no availability, the hospital is not going to let that person sit there. They're not going to hold someone past the point that they're ready to discharge because they're not getting paid. Medicare, the insurance company Uh will not pay once that person is no longer meeting set criteria to be hospitalized. And so what happens then is if a bed is not available at the facility that the family wants, the hospital uh, caseworker will set up a discharge to the first facility that they can find to accept that patient. That's not always in the same town. It's not always in the same state. Um, So who sets up all of those travel arrangements and and getting there? The caseworker at the hospital would be the one responsible for setting that up. Now the trick there is... They don't always set up getting them home. That's usually left up to the family. I see. And during the COVID pandemic, um, I was working in the hospital at the time, and it was not uncommon for us to discharge patients because the facilities were taking fewer people. There were Mm -hmm. more people being discharged from the hospital, and we were discharging people as far out as three and four states over. Wow. Well, let me ask you, what other options are there when you're leaving the hospital? Uh, what, what other potential scenarios might we have? So the other possibility is returning home okay. with physical therapy being set up at home because some people may have a better support network. They may be able to do that at home. Um, some people just have really strong aversions to going into a facility. Maybe they've had a bad experience. Maybe they've mm. had a bad experience with a family member. Um, the option there is that they can go home 
and physical therapy can come to them and they can finish recovering at home. Okay, so physical therapy can follow you in a way. It can't. You don't Physi have to go into a like a rehabilitation center. Physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, mm -hmm. most uh, rehabilitative therapies can follow you home. Now it can become complicated if you are needing um, very detailed equipment, like if you need a specific piece of equipment to be able to do that physical therapy, that may not be practical. Right. But there again, if you can be transported, if you can move, if you're mobile, then you may be able to go to an outpatient rehab to do that physical therapy. Like for example, if you've got a broken leg or you've had a hip replacement, you're going to need to be doing exercises that you may not have the equipment at home to be able to do. And during those situations, if you can be transported to an outpatient rehab facility, then you can do that rehab there and go home afterwards. We also have the benefit in those facilities of having a coach, if you will, someone to Correct. lead you through those to make sure you're doing them right and getting the most benefit out of doing them. Correct. They're very well-trained, well-skilled. We've got some great rehabilitation centers uh, here in, uh, in our town, and, and it's just mm -hmm. amazing to see them working with their patients. Absolutely. Yeah, they're very, uh, very good. Center. Are there any other scenarios? And I know you were talking about a fellow, I forgot his name now, but you were talking about a fellow that, um, that had an interesting experience through the hospital stay and, and in leaving. And I think the name that we came up with was a very generic, uh, you know. Bob. Bob, yes, everybody. <laughs> Identities have been changed to protect the uh, HIPAA privacy, of course. Actually, we were talking about creating a, a Bob to um, go oh, into the right. hospital and, and kind of a, a test patient to just provide a, a possible experience. Of, a good example. Of what someone yeah. would encounter going through the hospital system, including... Uh, going through discharge and rehabilitation. And um, again, <coughs> it really does depend on why the person was in the hospital. And I'm going to give you a good example, like I was mentioning with the broken leg or the hip replacement. Yeah. That's going to be a very different type of rehab than someone who is in the hospital for a heart attack. There are different types of really? rehab. There's cardiac rehab. There is even a concussive rehab if you have a brain injury. Okay, like a traumatic brain injury, a TBI. And, and it seems like if you had movement, uh, it, the inability with a broken leg, broken hip, uh, knee replacement, if, if you're having mobility problems, the rehab is going to be very different than if you, after you've had heart issues, I suppose you don't want to get terribly excited, but you can still move around. Correct. Correct. In fact, they encourage movement, mm -hmm. I think, to get you back on your feet as soon as possible, it seems. When you're coming out of a hospital these days, they back, it seems like they want you back on your feet. If they could, I think they'd walk you from the, uh, fr from the operating room back to your room. No, I'm kidding. It's not that bad. Actually, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, actually, they do want you up and walking as soon yeah. as possible, though, because that minimizes the risk for blood clots. Oh, that's so right. So that is important. That's right. That is important. But the discharge process can be different for everyone, like I said, depending on why they're in the hospital. Okay. But the bottom line, what it is most likely going to include is a caseworker at the hospital who okay. is going to work with you to set up your discharge plan. Now, that in and of itself can be complicated because depending on the quality of the hospital, um, there have been situations where discharge plans have been created without the patient's participation. Um, and that can happen. Now, how does that work? Basically, what happens... I take it that doesn't happen all the time, but... No comment. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. We hope not. We hope right. not. But it really right. does depend on the quality of the hospital. Oh. A good hospital will include not just the patient, but the family in the discharge planning. Yeah. But we all know that there are hospitals out there that may not be as good a quality as others, and therefore their standards and their procedures are not going to be as detailed and as thorough. And what can happen is if you have a hospital that is slammed 
and they're out of yeah. beds and they're needing to empty those beds, you're going to see patients who are being pushed to discharge, sometimes maybe even before they're ready. And that's something you don't really think about, mm -hmm. but the dynamic of what the hospital needs and what the community needs from that hospital can dictate what you get as a patient absolutely. in some cases. Absolutely. And what there are limitations to everything. Absolutely. And what a lot of people don't know, especially our older citizens who yeah. are on Medicare, don't know that if they feel like they're being discharged prematurely, they can appeal that discharge. They can contact Medicare and they can appeal that discharge. Really? And they cannot be discharged until that appeal is completed. Now, every hospital is supposed to notify a patient of this prior to discharge. Okay. And uh, a lot of hospitals will actually require you to sign a form acknowledging that you've been told you can appeal your discharge. Now, oftentimes after you've had medical procedures or you're not feeling well, Many of those forms that the hospitals have you sign, you're signing. You don't read them all. And you don't all the time, at least I know I haven't always been fully aware of exactly what it Oh, it's another piece of paper. Okay, and I'll sign this one too, and then exactly. that one too. Exactly, exactly. And they do that. Um, and I'm not going to say they do it on purpose because I don't think they mean to. A lot of times it's just a matter of efficiency. You know, but there are a lot of papers that need to be signed. You're consenting to treatment. You're consenting to rehab. You're releasing HIPAA information. You're um, acknowledging this. You're acknowledging that. And somewhere buried in that stack of papers is your acknowledgement that you've been told, whether you have been or not, mm -hmm. you're acknowledging that you've been told you can appeal your discharge. I, you know, I've signed a lot of papers over many years. I never noticed that piece of paper before. A lot of people don't. And that's why it really, uh, I think it's important that this is a sort of information that we love to share with our mm -hmm. audience, both the listening audience, the viewing audience, because it's valuable information. It can right. change how you manage your own district. It gives you power. It, knowledge is power. And that empowers you to be able to perhaps change the course of your treatment mm -hmm. and care. And just being aware of that going in can change greatly how you and your doctors coordinate and communicate with one another. Well, and there's a lot that goes into a hospital stay and a discharge that people don't realize. For example, for example, tragic story that, that I encountered with a patient once. Um, he lived alone, came into the hospital, and while he was hospitalized, no one knew he had a pet at home. Okay, well, guess what? Most hospital case managers are not going to ask you if you have a pet at home. And it wasn't until the gentleman was being evicted because he had not paid his rent because he was in the hospital that it was discovered that there had been a pet locked in the apartment all that time. See, oh when, when you're in the hospital, if you don't have family, if you don't have a friend, if you don't have someone that you can partner with, your bills aren't getting paid whatever is in the apartment is not being taken care of. Um, everything that you do in your day-to-day -day life yeah, the things you comes do every to a screeching day. halt if there's not someone there that can pick that up for you. Right, I think of so many things around the household that you just do every day and don't even think about. It's just part of your routine, uh, it's part of your normal care of running a household, mm -hmm. even if it's just a small apartment, if it's a large house, but if you're by yourself, yeah. you're depending on yourself. And if you have a pet, that pet's depending on you. And that could be, a, if you came in to the hospital after a tragic accident and you're not fully conscious, that pet may not be the first thing on your mind. You know, one of the things that I recommend always is um, having a card in your wallet that just, yeah. it can be handwritten or it can be handwritten, laminated, whatever. But something that says, hey, I have pets at home, these are their names, this is their vet. Because a lot of times, if you have a good, responsible caseworker, um, first of all, they're going to be going through that wallet. Sorry, it happens. That's how they find your insurance information. And a lot of times, a lot of times I've had Jane and John Doe's come into the trauma department. That was how I found out who they were. 
Yeah, if you're in a traffic accident and you come in unconscious, uh, no one knows to call a next of kin. No one knows if you exactly. have a next of kin exactly. or a place to live. So you come in, somebody's going to have to find out who you are. And, and how many times did the local uh, police department stand there saying, we don't know who they are, we got no way to find out, and a few minutes later, the social worker walked around the corner and said, this is who they are, this is where they live, this is their next of kin, I've already called them. Sometimes police know, sometimes the police is able to provide that information to, to the hospital worker. Yeah. Sometimes it's the other way around, depending on how good of a Sherlock Holmes they have working in the trauma department. There you go. Well, it's important to have that personnel there advocating for the patient, and that's really what the social worker does. So when you see your social worker come around, realize that they're on your side. They can be trusted and they can be given that information because they're really there to help you. And they will work with you as much as possible, but even they have limitations based on the hospital setting. Um, but again, it's important to include as much information as you can in your wallet or in your pocketbook, yeah. um, including next of kin. And by the way, a lot of people do this in case of emergency contact on their phones. Guess what? We can't access that if we can't unlock your phone. Now, isn't that a great thought? That's so right. Right. A, a lot of times what I have done uh, and what a lot of people that I've spoken with have done is they have included on their lock screen in case of emergency contact this person because then you don't have to unlock the phone to get that information. Well, another thought I just had for some folks who might have uh, biometric locks on their smartphones uh, the nurse in the emergency room could actually use a thumb or a forefinger on the screen to unlock it. And that might be a good idea to use biometrics uh, to give access to medical professionals who, who might need that. That thought does occur to a lot of social workers in the emergency department, <laughs> but usually only once the patient is deceased, because if they're still alive, there are more important things going on. Well... That's also a good thought. Well, not a good thought, but it's a, yeah. yeah it's I a pertinent understand. thought. It's a pertinent <laughs> thought. And on that pertinent thought, of course, this is all a highly personal choice and no conversation that we have on the Lightkeepers podcast should ever take the place of your own medical care team or other professional advisor who should always be consulted by you on your specific situational needs. And it's always good to be willing to talk about quality of life because every single one of us may face some of these situations at some point and will either not be prepared at all or very well prepared indeed from watching the Light Keepers podcast. That's every Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. Eastern. The Lightkeepers podcast is an exclusive production of Vanimation Studios and is brought to you by A Guiding Light, a 501c3 nonprofit charity organization dedicated to education for professionals and information for everyone else that allows informed preparation for living the very best life possible. The mission of A Guiding Light is to provide education for professionals, information for everyone else about life planning, available guidance, and counseling that helps individuals and their family members navigate options and improve the quality of their remaining days. The organization is committed to training professionals through scholarship grants when needed who will help you find the best information so you can be aware of your options and choices, confident in your decisions, and at peace that you've made the very best decisions to live life on your own terms. Visit the website at aguidinglight.org or to make a tax-deductible contribution, just write to the address right here on the screen below me and find the, help others find the resources and information that they need. We sincerely hope you'll join the conversation in the coming weeks and your questions and comments below will add to that conversation. Speaking of that, hit the like and subscribe buttons. It's free and hit that little bell. Click the bell that tells you when our next episode is going to be airing so you don't miss a single show on the Lightkeepers podcast. I'm Clayton Vandiver, your Lightkeeper. We'll see you here.